So I would like to introduce, introduce to you our, an activist and organizer, a badass, a future president from homelessness in high school to the forefront of the reproductive justice movement in Dean's List at Columbia University. Deja is changing the world at 19 years old. She's been named 18, both 21, under 21, she's 19, and she joined the Days 100 Received Planned Parenthood Catalyst for Change Award, founded both the El Rio Reproductive Health Access Pro Project, and started Jen's Z Girl Game. So definitely follow her on Instagram, look her up. She became Max Cosmetics' youngest ever ambassador, joined Nike as a dream leader, and most recently took leave from university to work full time as an influencer and surrogate strategist, a youngest staffer at the Kamala Harris campaign. Please help me welcome Deja Fox. Thanks. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. No? This okay. So my name is Deja. Um, this can be. I want this to be kind of like a informal conversation. I have some notes here about things, a road map of where I want this conversation to go. But I do want this to be a conversation. And when I talk about my experiences with homelessness, it's one of those talks where I don't really script it out. I want to like see where you are at. So I really appreciate if you snap, if you hear something you really like. It's okay if you cry. I want to make eye contact with you. I understand if you have to step out for another class or if something feels heavy and you want to take a break. Um, just as like a warning, I'm going to talk about abuse and neglect and substance abuse in this talk. Um, so know that that's coming. Um, and then to give you a roadmap of where we're headed, I'm going to chat, talk at you for about 30 minutes. Um, but I want you to be talking back to me with your snaps or your eyes. Um, feel free to take your phone out. Um, you can take pictures, put it on Instagram, and tag me, and I'll share. Uh, you can also connect with me on Instagram after. Uh, and then we'll have 30 minutes to have some Q&A time. So time where you can ask me questions publicly, because if you have a question, other people might benefit from hearing it as well. Uh, and then I'll be floating around for a bit so we can chat more privately um, as well. Also, now would be a good time. I'm going to make some space if you want to come up closer to me. You can. Um, I don't bite, I swear. Plus I like this to be an intimate conversation. There's not so many of us, which is kind of, kind of a plus. I like to chat like this. Um, thanks for moving up, brave souls. Um, all right, so again, my name's Deja Fox. Uh, I'm 19 years old. Uh, I'm an activist and an organizer and a badass. Um, and I plan to one day be president of the United States. Um, and to start this conversation, to frame our conversation today around my journey from homelessness to higher education, I think we really have to start even before I was born. Because so many of your indicators of if you're going to college happen before you even exist. So for context, I'm a first generation American. My dad came to this country when he was 13. He got a GED. My mom barely graduated high school. Her mom had her as a teenager and didn't graduate high school. And so before I even opened an eye, before I was ever in a classroom, there were already determinants of if I was going to college or not. And it was pretty stacked against me. Um, and growing up, it wasn't the norm to go to college. No one was really asking me if I planned to, and no one really had the expectation that I would. Um, but that sort of started to shift when, in kindergarten, one teacher saw my potential and told my mom I needed to take this test. And my mom was like, what is this test? Um, and it was for the gifted program. And I ended up scoring really well, um, which then meant that I needed to go to a school, not in my neighborhood, um, and be in classes with kids who weren't like me. And in first grade, I started going to this school called Line Weaver. Um, and at first I loved it. It was full of teachers who had the capacity to really invest in me. There was only 18 students in my very first class. Um, but as I got a little bit older, second, third, fourth grade, I began to feel really out of place. Because in this gifted program, 
it was mostly white kids. They were middle class, they had two parents at home, and even though I couldn't put my finger on it when I was so young, I knew I didn't feel like I fit in. And I'd always come home on like the first or second day of school and tell my mom, like, I don't wanna go back. I, I wanna go back to the school with the kids from the neighborhood. I wanna go back to school with my friends that I grew up with. She'd be like, give it two weeks, give it two weeks. And I'd give it two weeks and I stuck it out and I stuck it out all the way through graduation. Um, and as I transitioned into middle school, um, this feeling of like split got even bigger because the school that had the gifted program at it was actually in my neighborhood. Surprise. But, and you would think that that's a benefit, except for me, I was then faced directly with my two lives. My life at home and all the kids I'd grown up with, the kids that literally lived on my block, who were not in my classes, but on campus with me, and the kids I'd gone to school with first through fifth grade who knew me in one sense, and the kids who knew me in another. And there was this like intense split and pressure that I was feeling at such a young age to be right for both, both people, be right for both groups. Um, and it was something that taught me how to be one person in the classroom, one person with these friends, one person at home. Um, and middle school is also the time when my mom first started to struggle with substance abuse. So my mom, up until about age 11, had always had trouble keeping a job, right? She barely graduated high school. We didn't have any family where I lived. Um, and she bounced from job to job, often doing like contracted work, working as caregiver for like older people, doing that like night shift kind of thing. Uh, she worked at a post office for a few years, at a florist for like a while. The most random jobs, um, but couldn't hold them down for very long. Uh, and so, when I was 11, there began to be these issues of education. She's someone who comes from a long line of trauma, too, in her um, And began to self-medicate as our lapses in healthcare coverage uh, really affected her mental health. Um, and that's the story for a lot of young people whose parents struggle with substance abuse, that it's often because of these lapses um, in, system, in systems that are meant to care for us. Um, but nonetheless, I began to have this really private home life that I wanted to keep secret of what was happening at home, of the way my mom was beginning to spiral out and be less and less like the mom that I knew. And then I had this other life in the classroom where I wanted to hold up to the standards that I had learned first through fifth grade of how to be in class, how to be around these white kids, and then how to be with my friends from my neighborhood. And I began to try to be all of these people all at once. Uh, and by high school, I'd gotten really, really good at it. I'd gotten really good at pretending nothing was going wrong. I'd gotten really good at saying, oh, my mom's picking me up down the street. I I'll see you guys later. And like running to the bus stop and like, hoping no one's parents would see me as they drove by to get their kids. Um, <laughs> and all these little like white lies that kept me feeling safe, kept me very far away from my problems but also kept me alone in my problems. And it wasn't until sophomore year of high school, when things had gotten so bad at home, um, that I really learned how, how to ask for help. Um, so to kind of put you in the moment of what sophomore year was for me. Sophomore year, I didn't get reelected to student council, in large part because I couldn't keep up with everyone anymore. I didn't have the right clothes, I wasn't, I wasn't keeping up with standards, I wasn't going to the same parties, we didn't have a car, I wasn't making it to things. Um, I just wasn't as popular. I didn't make the volleyball team, and the coach told me it was because I had a bad attitude, which anyone going through what I was going through at home, my mom would be gone for long periods at a time, we weren't making rent, there wasn't food. Anyone going through what I was going through would have a badass attitude too. <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to curse, oops. Um, but anyway, I didn't make that team. And I was falling in with a group of people, spending less and less time at home, because it was a bad environment for me. I fell in with a group who were in similar situations to me, who I felt like I could share with, who I felt like I could connect with. And though we were all struggling together, we, we were all kids. And I felt safer with them. Uh, but in many aspects, my life was in danger a lot of the time. There were so many times where there were drugs and alcohol and guns 
around me. So many times when I think about it now, and I'm only like, what, three years out of it, where I'm like, I literally could have died that night, or that was such a dangerous situation. And I was getting in trouble left and right. I'm talking with police, with administrators at my school, with family members, with friends. Um, and I was on this path going a really different direction um, than most of my classmates. And I was reminded, you know, I was even seeing friends have kids at this point. Like, my life at school and the, the life of my friends in class was heading a really different direction than the lives of the friends I was, like, bouncing around and staying with um, and kind of the direction I was going to. And so I think sophomore year was kind of this, like, point where I had to make a decision. And I ultimately made the decision that I needed to leave my mom's house, that the environment was too dangerous for me, that the toxicity of the environment was so much worse than just being on my own. And I opted to actually just bounce around. I opted to stay with friends because it felt safer. I opted to stay with boyfriends and people in my personal network. And young people are really blessed in that way. Um, youth homelessness is often characterized as hidden homelessness because so many of us have these really great personal networks that make it really hard to see when we are experiencing housing instability. Um, and so housing instability is characterized in a lot of different ways. I hear a lot of people say, well, I'm not homeless, like, I have a place to stay. But if you don't have a home of your own, or you're a young person who's on their own, estranged from their family, I was someone who always had a friend to stay with, always had to be, um, and always felt like it could be worse. Uh, but as I looked at my classmates, I realized that this was not normal. And that it was beginning to impact my grades. I was never a straight A student. Though when I got to college and had a meal in a dorm plan, I was a straight A student. Um, but anyway, I fell in with this group of people, and I was at this low point. I'd gotten in trouble in a lot of different aspects. And I didn't feel like a leader. I had no outlet for my leadership. And that was when my life had this big turning moment. And it was when an organizer from Planned Parenthood reached out to me and asked if I wanted to go to a training. And it was this moment where I could have just said no. But instead, I felt comfortable with her. She was someone who looked like me. She was someone who also came from immigrant parents. She, she felt comfortable. And I felt like I could share. And I told her, no, my family doesn't have a car. And she took the next step and showed up for me and said, girl, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll drive you. It's fine. I'm going there anyway. I'll give you a ride. And she gave me a ride to that training. And from there on, it's history. Um, that one training got me in the loop. And then we had a one-on-one -on -one meeting. And we sat down and we talked. And she asked me questions about what I cared about and how my life was and who my friends were and what was going on at home. And I felt safe sharing with her, and so I did. And as I began to share with her, we found places where my story could create change. And she asked me, what issues are impacting you? And I told her about how my sex education class at school, which was last updated in the 80s and was mostly abstinence-based, was, was not helpful to me. And how my white male teacher sat and like skipped through this PowerPoint on contraceptives, and he told me, he told the class, I don't, I don't need to go through this, your parents will teach you this stuff. And he meant that because I was at this mostly white school with two parents at home, that sort of gag, that the, their parents had the resources to teach them, that their parents would do it, and that it wasn't his job, that he didn't care to. And I was sitting there as one of the few students who didn't have a parent at home, knowing that no one would teach this to me if he didn't. And knowing that I was one of the students in this room who needed it the most someone who was often living with boyfriends. Um, and so I told this story to my organizer, Melissa, and she said, well, let's make a difference. Let's make a change. And I started going to school board meetings every Tuesday and getting up at community call and telling my story. And the very first time I did it, I was so scared because I'd been conditioned not to talk about things going on at home, not to talk about my experiences with homelessness, not to talk about struggle, and I had written on like this little note card everything I wanted to say, like word for word. And I stood there at this podium, 
these five school board members on this raised dais and maybe like 20 community members in attendance and I was literally shaking. You could hear my voice shaking. I was so scared to share this story. And it was only two minutes. Obviously, I'm more comfortable now. Um, but I got up and I shared the story and I don't remember what I said or if it even went well, but I remember that when I sat down, I felt different. I had shared my story for the first time publicly and there was no going back. And I started to organize my peers. I started to teach my peers how to tell their stories, how to frame their stories, how powerful their stories could be in creating change. And we'd show up to school board meetings, pack school board meetings, and tell our stories, take over community call, and make our elected officials listen to us. And after six months, we won. And we won big. And I sat for the next year and a half rewriting the curriculum for my school district. And I began to scale up my work because I saw how powerful my story could be and how often we're conditioned to leave out the most important and most powerful parts of our stories because of shame. Um, and that when I owned my experience, and when I said that this experience was mine, and it's powerful because I know it's power, and I want to share it, um, there was just some magic to that that really, really changed the way that I saw myself, the way that I saw my agency, and the way that I saw my leadership. Um, and so I began to scale my work, and the next year, when I was 16, uh, I went to a town hall with Senator Jeff Flake. He was a Republican senator in Arizona, and there was a thousand people in this town hall, and everyone was yelling, and it was a very energized environment. And I waited for 45 minutes to ask him a question. And when I got up there, I asked him, this grown white man elected in office, how he, as a white man who came from privilege, could make decisions about my body as a woman of color, as a young woman, as someone who didn't have parents at home, because he had just voted to cut funding for Title X, which was how I and four, other, four million other people, low-income people, access birth control. And I asked him why, why he felt he had the right to take away my right to make that choice, to make that choice about my health care. Um, and he told me he supported policies that supported the American dream. <laughs> and I said, then why would you deny me the American dream? Because I saw even then the way that my sexual health, my reproductive health, and control over my body was tied to my control over my future. And that from sex ed to birth control access to abortion access, being able to control my body meant being able to control if I went to college, when I went to college, if I had kids, if I didn't. Um, and so this encounter with Senator Jeff Flake went viral, and the next day, 17 million people had seen it, and my life and my story had been for thrusted to the forefront of the narrative. And I'd been doing this work silently. You know, I'd been going to school board meetings, doing it in my small community, and all of a the sudden, there was this spotlight on my life, this thing that I said I wouldn't share, that I was too embarrassed to share, that I lied to people and ran to the bus stop about a year, like a year ago, was making national headlines. And the next day I went live on CNN, and I was so nervous. I sat on my bedroom floor with my organizer and talked to her about what I was going to say, what I could do. Rap not on my bedroom floor, on my boyfriend at the time's bedroom floor. <laughs> um, and was talking to her about what I was gonna say and what I was gonna do. Um, and she said, don't worry about it. You're, you've been working towards this. You've been preparing for this. And reminded me that when, when speaking, when giving interviews, that's 1% of the work. I'd already done 99% of the work just by living my experience. And communicating it was just that last piece. And that I would be fine as long as I was authentic and as long as I was true to myself. So at 16, I was live on CNN, scary, but done. Um, and I went on to work and lobby on Capitol Hill and walk into senators' offices and Congress people's offices and tell my story again and again and again in these places of power that people like my mom would never have the opportunity to go. And talk to people who made decisions for people like me, who often had never heard from someone like me, who definitely didn't come from backgrounds like mine. And I realized in that moment that I not only 
wanted to be in those positions of power, so that way when people like me came to the door, I could open it. But so that way I could bring my perspective to Capitol Hill, because they obviously needed it. Um, and that was also when I decided that maybe college was for me. It was this huge confidence bump where I realized just how powerful I really was. Um, and I decided that maybe it wasn't just college that was for me. Maybe I could go to the best college. Maybe I could go to the college of my dreams. And I applied to Columbia, and I only applied to Columbia. And now I want to take a moment to pause here, because it sounds like everything's going great, right? Everything's on the up and up. But I want to make the point that you can struggle and succeed at the same time. So I want to let you know that while all of this was going on, while I was going viral, while I was speaking to senators on Capitol Hill, I was still working at the gas station. I worked at the gas station from the week after I turned 16 till a week before I moved to New York to go to school at Columbia. That's, that's a whole two years. Um, and while this was happening, I was still housing insecure. I was still technically homeless. I was living with my boyfriend at the time and his family. They had taken me in. They were these two amazing Mexican immigrants, monolingual Spanish speakers. One is a landscaper and another cleans houses. And they were by no means rich. But they had the space in their family and the space in their heart and the space in their home for an extra. And that was me. And so I lived in their home with them. And I worked at a gas station and I was on CNN. And I was organizing. And I was working on Capitol Hill. And you can have both of those things going on at the same time. And struggling doesn't mean that you can't be succeeding. And succeeding doesn't mean that you can't be struggling. And not everyone will see both parts. Um, but you can be having a full experience while doing both. Um, but as I returned from my experience lobbying on Capitol Hill, I knew I wanted to give back to my community because I knew I wanted to go to New York for college. And so I asked myself, how can I give back in a way that is really true to me? And I started the El Rio Reproductive Health Access Project. And the El Rio Rap Project, or El Rio Rap, was built and founded by other homeless youth like me, by teen moms, by teens who had formerly struggled with substance abuse, who had been incarcerated, um, and we worked to train them as peer sex educators, and we found funding to get them paid, and every week they worked in our clinics to help consult on birth control and to teach sex education, um, and we also found funding so that every patient that came into our teen clinics could receive birth control, STI testing, or PrEP at absolutely no cost to them. Uh, and since I started it in 2017, uh, we've served over 4,000 young people in my hometown. And it's a pretty small town. Uh, and so when I walked away, I knew that I'd changed my hometown, not just by being a good role model, which I had, but in this tangible way. And I knew that 4,000 people, that was bigger than the size of my high school. That, that's the sort of thing that changes a community forever, that makes generational change. Um, but even more important than that to me was that when I walked away, I got to hand it down. And I handed it down to a young woman who, when she was 16, had asked me if she could come to one of my events, one of my El Rio rap events. And I said, yeah, sure. And she told me, but I don't have a car. And my family, you know, doesn't have transportation. I said, don't worry, I'll give you a ride. And so even more important to me than the 4,000 young people, well, equally important, uh, to the 4,000 young people who I was able to help get birth control, which was essential to my, or to my journey to higher education, was helping this young woman, who now is like my sister, also find her leadership. Um, and she's applying to college this year. She's already gotten into four schools. Um, and she'll be the first in her family to go to college too. And so when I think about the impact of the work that I do and my journey from homelessness to higher education, I think a lot about the way that my community invested in me, whether it was the people who let me sleep on their couch one night or the family who took me in long term or the counselor who came to the office when the principal was yelling at me to say, leave that girl alone and pull me out and could see me as a whole person and knew what was going on. The same counselor who, when I was trying to put my mom up in a motel every night, 
slipped me two hundred dollars once to make sure that I was taken care of. Um, the community members like Melissa, who all she had to do was believe in me as a leader, to help me see myself as a leader, so that I could make a difference. And when I think about how my community invested in me, I then have to think about the way that I reinvest in my community, and how proud I am to have started that program, and to be a good role model, and show up every day for all the little sisters out there, real life and digital. Um, because I think when we're talking about youth homelessness, we have to think about it in two, two contexts. We need to think about the larger context of how, how is this happening. We need to be thinking about the opioid crisis. And we need to be thinking about a lack of mental health care and deportation and mass incarceration and the affordable housing crisis and how when we work in those areas, as we do work in our particular um, issue areas, we're also contributing to helping homeless youth. And we also need to think about how in our everyday individual actions, how we show up for each other, how we can create a culture of community care. I think we often hear people talk about self-care and sometimes we think about like baths and face masks, but at the core of self-care, it's saying that we have to care for ourselves. But when I was 15, there was no way I could care for myself. I couldn't work a job, I couldn't sign a lease, and I needed people to show up for me. And so, as we think about the kind of communities we want to cultivate, I really believe that community care is what we need to be focused on. How can we reinvest in each other and build power in the people around us? Um, whether it's saying, I'll give you a ride, or saying I have an extra room, or picking up groceries for someone, whatever it is, um, asking how we can play a part in creating a community where we look out for each other, where we meet each other where we're at. Um, and then the other big takeaway I want you all to know is that homeless youth are not as uncommon as you might think. Uh, across college campuses, 36% of young people say that they struggle with, with housing security. And on community college campuses, that's nearly 42%. Um, and so, even in high schools, when we look at what the numbers look like, it's one in 30. So I don't know what your class sizes look like, but mine were about 30 people. And so in every classroom, in every high school, there's likely a student struggling with housing insecurity. And so whether you're someone who works in schools, who wants to work in schools one day, or with young people one day, uh, or you're a young person yourself who's struggling with homelessness, because so many of us do, um, I hope that you can take away that idea of community care, of either knowing how to ask for help and knowing that when you share your story, it has a larger impact, that your story is powerful, and that your experiences are yours and you own them, and they're yours to share and yours to create change with. Um, and that if you're on the other end of it, maybe you've seen it through to the other end, um, or you work with homeless youth or youth in general, that you, you keep an eye out for those indicators and that you never make assumptions because I was one of those kids that you would have never thought something was going on at home because I was really good at hiding it. So to be as generous as you can be with your assumptions about young people and share things about yourself, create an open dialogue um, where people feel comfortable sharing with you. Um, and then lastly, I want to take you a little bit into my college journey. So I think oftentimes when we get into college or when we make this step into adulthood, um, we kind of think that, or at least for me, when I made it into Columbia, everyone was like, she made it. She's set. Um, but when I moved to New York, I actually got flown in for a shoot uh, for New York Fashion Week. And I couldn't afford a plane ticket to Columbia anyway. So I was like, this is perfect, I'm flying out, I'm just gonna get this one-way ticket. But it was a week before classes started, and they wouldn't let me move in early, and I had no place to stay. And so I was someone who was in a New York Fashion Week show, was uh, going to Columbia and literally homeless for the week before I could start. And so again, I want you to remember that you can be struggling and succeeding at the same time, and it doesn't make any one less valid. Um, 
and it's in so many ways characterizes um, what makes some of us so different from the people I've met at Columbia, many of whom have had it set for forever, who have never had to worry or struggle, um, and that's not to say that they've never hurt or felt pain, but have never had to face the same kind of struggles that I have or that you might. Um, and I want you to know that it's those kinds of struggles and successes um, that we need in this world. And that our generation is going to face some of the biggest challenges, be it climate change or the rise in nationalism and hate. And these are things that can't be reversed. Things that if our generation doesn't act now, we may never have the chance to. And we need young people who have diverse perspectives at the forefront, whether it's on campaigns like me, or knocking doors, or running for office. Um, we need young people who have that sense of resiliency and resourcefulness in our workforce. And it's all of our jobs, whether it's us who struggled to show up and take up space and to ask for help, or whether you work with the young people to really uplift and meet those people where they're at. Because though I go to Columbia, I still am not on the same playing field as the other kids. And it's our job to equal that playing field. It's our job to cultivate a generation of leaders who have struggled, meet them where they're at, so that way they can really bring that diverse perspective um, into whatever field it is that they're, they're gonna be um, dominating, leading. Because I can only imagine if my teachers in high school had had a similar experience to me, or if my senator, when I was confronting him, had maybe experienced homelessness himself, how, how different these interactions would have gone, and how much less my life would have had to been in opposition, how much less my existence would have had to been in opposition. Um, so those are the things that I hope you take away. Uh, and I want to open it up to questions now. Um, there's still so many questions, or so many stories um, I want to share with you all, but I get, I'm going to open it to questions now so we can get a sense of where you guys want to take the conversation, now that you know me. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I appreciate you being here. I, I was telling um, uh, my friend here that based how articulate you are, um, expressing um, you know, your, your ability to uh, really convey what it is you're trying to say. Thank I'm you. sure that takes time, right? Sure does. For you to get and polish the way you are, I would like to hear that that journey that it took for you to find. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to say finding your voice. If you agree to that. Okay. Finding your ability to speak out loud and share your story. Yeah, public speaking isn't easy. It's a learned skill for sure. It's something that, um, you know, I, I think my very first time sort of speaking in public was when I got up in front of that school board and had that little card and was shaking and cried after and was so nervous. Um, and I think there's an added layer to public speaking when you're sharing your personal story, right? It's one thing to get up and read a speech or give a presentation in class, but it's another thing to stand in front of people and be vulnerable and say, this is me, and I'm gonna be my full version of myself in front of you, um, in front of lots of eyes. Is there a problem hearing me? No. No, okay. Um, but I think that the journey for me was practice and practice and practice. And I think one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was that you don't need to be perfect. One of the Planned Parenthood staffers, I was giving this speech um, to Congress members of Congress, and I was so nervous. And I was like, nothing's, like the speech is written, but it's not perfect, I haven't, I haven't gotten all of it right. Like, I was freaking out. I went to the bathroom, and I was like, oh, I can't do this. And someone pulled me aside and said, no one's expecting you to be perfect. No one expects you to be an expert in anything but your experience. And whenever I get up here, I, I was nervous to give this talk. I was like, what am I going to tell them? Should I write something out? And then I was like, you know, no. Because no one ever really remembers exactly what you said. If I quizzed you on when I did this and what year was that, you wouldn't remember. But you'll walk away remembering how I made you feel. And I think when I prioritize getting up and being my most authentic self, getting up in front of people and connecting with them, that's when I walk away feeling like I've done the right thing. And I walk away feeling successful about having spoken to folks. Um, and when you know that you can't lose when you get up and talk to people by just being the best version of yourself, uh, I think that that's when you can get really comfortable. Uh, also, just give yourself some slack. You're a young person. No one expects you to be an expert. You don't have to have all the facts and history. Um, 
People just want to know who you are. Another question? Don't be scared. Yeah. So I know that part of um, so I know that in um, sharing your story, you're kind of hoping to inspire people. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know, I you mentioned the Melissa, I think, mm -hmm. who inspired you to yeah, become yeah. a leader. Were there any other people who inspired you outside of your actual people that you knew, mm -hmm. like artists, musicians, or any other mm -hmm. like weird sources of inspiration that motivated you, or was it? Yeah, yeah, I think. I'm someone who, I'm not particularly religious, like I don't go to church every Sunday, but I'm very spiritual. And there was this poem um, called Desiderata that like really spoke to me, and there's this line in it um, that says something along the lines of the universe is always unfolding as it should. And I took that line with me everywhere, like when things were not going well at home, when I didn't get in. Um, I originally, in middle school, was trying so hard to get out of my living situation that I applied to this like boarding school in like Massachusetts. Like, was gonna go live with the super duper wealthy kids, and I was like, I'm out of here. <laughs> Fell through, um, and I'm glad that it did because it pushed me to then be in a space where I had to sit with my struggle and I had to learn how to tell my story. And instead of running away from my story, I got to lean into it. Um, but that poem and my spirituality are a source of inspiration for me. I would also say that a source of inspiration to me um, is the young women who look up to me and the young people who look up to me. I know how badly I wanted a role model when I was in high school. I remember distinctly Googling like homelessness to Harvard, homelessness to Columbia, and I found like one or two stories, both of which were white people, and I was like, hmm, I guess. Like that's great, but that I don't see myself in this person and I don't see myself in this story. Um, and I, I just really want to be that inspiration. I want to be that role model that I didn't have. Uh, because I know how hard it is to not have people that are from where you're from and who are going where you're going. Um, and since doing this work, since growing a platform on Instagram and social media, I've had so many young people reach out to me and say, when you spoke at this school or when you said this thing, it really made all the difference for me. I, one young woman really stands out in particular who you would have no idea had been living out of her car, her and her mom, um, and who reached out to me and told me that, you know, she thought about giving up on her dreams to be an actress, that's what she wants to do. Um, and as she was living in her car, kept telling her mom, no, I, I don't want to give up yet. I want to stay in LA, I want to keep doing this. And if Deja can do it, I can do it. And I had no idea that I was impacting her life in that way. Um, I think about my little sister, Emily, um, who, whose family has a very similar, um, similar issues to the, the family I was growing up in. Um, and my ability to be there for her, to help her write her college essays, to, to sit with her when she's sad, answer her calls when she cries, and be a good big sister to her. Um, I actually, I taught her how to drive. I did her makeup for her very first dance and like bought her a dress. Um, and being able to show up for people in that way inspires me. Because I know that um, when I look at them, I see 16 year old me. And that makes me feel, feel like the work that I'm doing is worth doing. Yeah. There was another question. Yeah, I had a question. Oh, I just heard crying because my name is Emily. Oh, and I just wish I had a bigger sister like you. Thank um, you. Thank you. Uh, what would you say? I'm not sure if this is really working or not. Um, <laughs> what would you say to somebody who just really wants to give up on themselves, who might have options, might have places to go, but wants to go so much further than that? Yeah. What would you say to them? Keep pushing. Um, life can change a lot in a year. I, it's tax season, right? Um, and you're like, what the hell are you talking about? I don't want to explain right now. Uh, in 2017, me and my mom combined made $7,000. That's not, a, if you're thinking that's not enough to live on, you're, you're right. <laughs> um, and life can change a lot 
a week after, I, a year and a day after I quit my job at the gas station, I was on a boat cruising past the Eiffel Tower with the Nike team after just having gone to the Women's World Cup game. Your life can change so much in a year. You have no idea when you set yourself up, when you believe in yourself, and when you position yourself in resource-rich environments, when you say what you're gonna do, and you let people know that you believe it, and push them to believe it too, um, you have no idea where you could go, where you'll be in a year. Um, and I think there was a lot of times where I wanted to quit. There was a lot of times where it seemed easier to just hang out with the same friends, keep getting in trouble, keep going down that path that I was on, and it could have been easier. It probably would have been. There were times where, you know, even now in my life where I could have stayed in school. I took the year off of Columbia to work on the Kamala Harris campaign. Um, and I could have stayed in school. It felt like the easy path. It felt like the right path. It felt like what I needed to do. It felt like what people are expecting me to do. But I sat down with myself and I asked, what do I want to do? What would make me happy? And I think when you follow what makes you happy, which, to be fair, no one was really asking me what was going to make me happy. No one was like, is a gas station job going to make you happy? <laughs> like, no. No one was asking me that question. So when I began to ask myself that question, and I started to go towards the things that brought me joy and excitement and inspiration and happiness, um, and I went with them full force, and I went toward them as though they were already mine. Um, that was, that, that's sort of the best advice that I have, is to just keep pushing and zoom out and know that your life could be so changed in such a short amount of time and you really have no idea. But to set those intentions and to set those big goals and to keep all of your doors open. I'll never forget, my eighth grade counselor told me, keep all your doors open and I tell myself that all the time now as I'm trying to figure out what I want to do. That like, I'll keep all my doors open and then I'll pursue that which brings me inspiration and joy and passion. Um, and ask for help. There's no shame in asking for help. Um, I learned how to ask for help when I was in a really bad situation. I had to. Um, and it served me well since. Now that I'm in a better situation, I've learned how to ask for help, and it's only elevated what I do. Um, and it's a skill that I think everyone should have. Any other questions? Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Um, I'm glad I had a... Oh, I'm doing this. It's fine. You just have to do okay. Yeah, hold the question. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad that I had a tissue. Sure. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, Community care. <laughs> yes. um, so thank you so much for sharing your story. Like um, I've been following you on Instagram for a very long hey. time. <laughs> and I really um, appreciate your ability to build community, not only like I guess in real life, but also digitally. Yeah. Um, but I want to know um, what I can relate to the whole pretending yeah. and getting away with not um, letting people in. Mm -hmm. So I want to know, what do you think your counselor that you know handed you those to that two hundred dollars? What do you think? What um, indications do you think they saw that let them know like she, you know, yeah. she needs to be seen? You know, I think there was a lot of indications, and when I think about it, I think my other teachers were blinded by their own bias. I had 23 absences in my first period. That's not normal. That your average student is not having 23 absences in the first semester in their first period. There's something going on there. But instead of seeing my behaviors, your normal student at my school is not getting in fights. I was getting in fights. Like When you see that behavior, and these were mostly white um, teachers and administrators, they saw my behavior as a reflection of my character and not my circumstances. And they didn't give me the benefit of the doubt. They, they were quick to assume that it was me being delinquent, me being a troublemaker, rather than my circumstances. And what made all the difference was that that counselor had actually been homeless herself with her daughter. Um, and that that counselor looked like me and had lived a life like me. And she saw me as a whole person. And she, she gave me the benefit of the doubt. 
she looked at me with a generous eye and said, you know, maybe these behaviors are a reflection of who she is as a person, but rather a reflection of what's going on at home. Um, and instead of casting me as the bad guy, instead of digging me into deeper holes of suspensions and referrals or whatever, she decided to step in in a different way. And, and I think that that made the difference. It was who was sitting in the office. And that's why I really think it's important that we invest in young people that have diverse experiences because we need you in that office. There's a kid 10 years from now that's going to need you to be sitting there. You know? Yeah, I think that was the biggest difference. Another question? Yeah. So I've been following you on Instagram as well. Hey, <laughs> turn up! Place. The whole gang's here! <laughs> but um, with you saying how life can change so fast within yeah. a year, I'm so curious as to how like your family kind of sees you and feels about this whole like yeah. spark. Yeah. Um, so family for me is kind of a big word. It's me and my mom. Me and my mom. I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to your question, but actually I wish I had sort of told you all this too. Um, so me and my mom have had a complicated relationship, right? Up to 11, she was a great mom. 11 things started to spiral. She was much less of my mom. She wasn't around often, and when she was, it was really abusive. Um, and there was periods of time where she'd be sober, and then she'd relapse sober and relapse. And one of those times of relapses uh, was actually when I was applying to college. Um, and that was when I was putting her up in the motel, when the counselor slipped me $200 to make sure I'd be good. Um, and that felt like the bottom. Like we were never gonna go up from there. But she went into rehab and she's since been sober for two years now. Um, and I care for her financially, which I'm blessed to be able to do. And she cares for the community in her own ways. She picks up groceries from the food pantry and like delivers them to neighbors who can't get their own. She recently was housing my little sister Emily's older sister and her baby um, in the house that I pay rent for. Um, and so I also, I want to take a note to say that like, the way that my family sees me now, I've always been sort of like another parent in my household. Me and my mom have always kind of like co-parented, um, which happens when you have a single parent, I think, sometimes. Um, but even more so now, I, I'm very much a caregiver to my mom. She's someone who still really struggles with um, mental illness, still doesn't have the access she needs to care. Um, and so that's the nature of the relationship I have with my mom. It's one that we're still building, and I call her every day now. I love to talk to her. Um, she gives me a sense of perspective and keeps me grounded. Um, and she also has this eye for generosity um, that is really inspiring to me. She's someone who has very little, but always finds a way to give. Um, and so the nature of my relationship to my family is one in which I'm able to now give back to them because I still recognize that my mom invested a lot in me as a single mom. As someone who's raising me, um, I feel a great debt to her even though she might have made mistakes. Um, and I'm blessed to be able to be repaying that debt now and see it repaid forward um, to community members around her. Um, family to me also uh, is my friends, the people who got me through it when I was at, at the bottom. Um, one of my best friends, uh, named Lahella, was homeless in high school too. And we went to the same school, we were both we're both women of color, both struggling with homelessness. She was someone who often lived out of her car, who lived with her boyfriend too, um, who worked two jobs and for a period of time, three jobs while going to school with me. Um, and she now uh, goes to University of Hawaii, she's native Hawaiian, uh, and she's doing Hawaiian studies. And she's able to like really chase that dream. Um, and this past winter, I was actually able to take her and my other best friend who had struggled with homelessness on this vacation to the Grand Canyon. Um, and we had snowball fights, and we laughed, and we hung out, and we got to be little kids together. Um, and so I'm really blessed to be able to reinvest in my friends in that way too, and sort of reclaim what it meant to be teenagers together, and give them that opportunity to just be young with me. Um, I think family for me also is the family who took me in. 
Um, and I still spend every Christmas with them whenever I go home. I, although me and my ex are broken up, um, I still stay in that house because that house is my house and that family is my family. And they have my pictures up on the wall, my prom photos, baby photos. I am a part of that family. Um, and like I said, they didn't have much. A landscaper, a house cleaner, neither of which speak English. Um, and my Spanish isn't awesome, but it's better now that I've lived there. Um, but for them, you know, my, re my relationship with them now that I've um, become a bit more successful is sometimes they don't really understand what I'm doing. And I think that that happens when we have immigrant parents sometimes. Um, that they don't quite understand exactly what it is that I'm doing, but they support me nonetheless. And for me, my family is people who support me, the behind the scenes me. The me that no one sees on Instagram. The me that doesn't sit in front of you here today, but is like curled up in a blanket on her couch back home in Tucson. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I've built a really diverse family network for myself. Um, one that's not so traditional, um, but one that has built the kind of foundation for me to be successful, um, and that I prioritize giving back to and reinvesting in in every way that I can. I also think that that's like the thing I'm most proud of is like, when I graduated high school and moved to Columbia, um, I bought my mom a car, and that was like one of my proudest moments. Um, I still like smile thinking about it. Okay. I think we have time for maybe one more question, and then I'll be floating around if you have any really deeply personal ones or want to share anything with me that you don't feel comfortable sharing in public. Come on, introvert. <laughs> Three, I'm gonna count it down. Three. Two, one, okay. <laughs> it's fun. Thanks for sharing the space with me, y'all. Appreciate it.